right, good afternoon. Welcome everyone to the afternoon session. Uh, my name is Dr. Lisa Williams. I am a, a faculty member at UNSW Science, uh, and I'd like to welcome you here today. Um, before we begin the content of today, I'd like to acknowledge the Cadigal people, the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting today. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge all traditional custodians of the lands and waters throughout Australia uh, and pay our respects to them and their cultures and to elders past, present, and emerging. So um, part of the aim of today is to bust some stereotypes. Uh, women can be, and as I think you'll see, are amazing scientists. Um, but when most people imagine a scientist, they often actually imagine um, someone in a light white coat, and frankly, quite frequently, a man. Um, it turns out that that task is changing. And if I asked you guys to do that, to close your eyes and imagine a scientist, more and more of you would start imagining women. And that's because the stereotype is changing. Um, let's be honest, any person can be a scientist. All it takes to do science is to have curiosity. Curiosity about the world around you, and then the drive to answer those questions. And it turns out scientists basically get paid to be curious about the world around them. I think that's pretty fantastic. So um, while we're at the busting stereotypes, I'd like to bust one more stereotype. Um, bring to mind different fields of scientist in your, uh, science in your brain. Maybe you're thinking of chemistry or biology, physics, any others? All right, yeah, one more, sure. Uh, forensics? Forensics, oh, that's a good one. And that's actually close to what my field of science is, which is psychology. It's not very often that people think of psychology as a discipline of science. Um, I'm a social psychologist, which means I study how people think, feel, and behave. And specifically, I study positive emotions. And so how people think and behave when they're feeling positive emotions like pride and gratitude. Um, so today, I reckon we've got lots of excitement in the room. It would be a great way to sort out what we do, how we think and behave when we're feeling pretty excited. So um, we're going to kick off today with our first talk. We're going to get right into it. Um, this First up, we'll have Tiffany Chen, who's Quality and Reliability Assurance Senior Scientist at BioLine. So let's welcome Tiffany. It's actually regulatory, not reliability. Oh, <laughs> so that's all right. It's usually written down as an acronym, so even I forget what it is sometimes. So hi, I'm Tiffany. I work at Byline, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my science journey. So when I was little, I thought I was going to be Batman <laughs> because I want to go and save the world. Um, I don't think I was a very girly girl if we're talking about stereotypes. I really like playing with Lego blocks, I had Transformers, I was, you know, being doctor to all my little stuffed animals, and I think that's sort of what got me into that sort of curious mode and getting into the science journey, and also because my dad graduated from the university and he dragged me along to his graduation, which seemed really boring, judging by that photo. <laughs> but I always knew university was something I had to do just because my dad went through it. So, the early years of my science journey, and this might be throwing it back to before you guys were all born, but I don't know if anyone knows about the wildlife animal fact files. <laughs> might be a bit of a throwback to the early 90s. So, my mum got, I, don't, I think she must have seen it on TV, so she got these fact files for me, and all they are are little, literally, A4 sheets of facts about mammals, birds, dinosaurs, environments, and I was obsessed with them, so I had binders and binders of these and I was waiting for the new delivery every three weeks for my new set of files and I think that's my earliest memory of being really into science just because I was obsessed with these fact files and I loved reading so I was always trying to read and sort of teach others so my two little sisters there are my unwilling participants <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I was trying to read to them but I was just always trying to teach people things and then I think when I was in primary school, there was a teacher, Miss Walden. I can't find a photo of her, so that's her. Similar hair. Um, I was always bringing bugs back from the playground. I think I brought ants back. I brought uh, 
caterpillars and I don't know, I was a bit of a weird kid. So <laughs> this teacher actually told my parents at parent-teacher conferences that your daughter shows an interest in biology and she should become a scientist. And I never really thought about becoming a scientist. I think at that point in time, I was on my third career choice of being a dentist or a vet. Um, or yeah, I wasn't wanting to be Batman anymore. That's, that moment had passed. <laughs> So in high school, I did the International Baccalaureate Diploma. Is everyone familiar with that? I think they offer in Australia. So IBs, it's not different from the HSC because I did school overseas. I was at an American school in Taipei and also in Shanghai. So with the IB Diploma, it's a very full-on course for two years. Um, that sort of sums up what IB is like. Mm -hmm. IB, therefore IBS, you learn how to BS really, really well. If any of these acronyms seem familiar to you, that is IB, you know more about acronyms. Um, you don't know what sleep is anymore. I think I slept about four hours every night for two years. Uh, came in handy once I came to university. <laughs> but one thing I found really helpful with the IB diploma is in science, they actually make, make you learn all these verbs. So design, define, distinguish. So on your exams, they'll give you a problem, be like, okay, so for this problem, what you have to do is describe something or explain something. So you really learn how to dissect problems, and that's what I thought IB really helped with, and it sort of drilled writing reports into you in a way where I can actually write reports with my eyes closed now in probably an hour. And that was very useful for university when you're so sleep deprived and running behind on schedule. And also with IB, got a chance to sort of do experiments that you designed yourself. So they really encourage people to try new things. That's a very old school iPod, which sort of shows my age. That was, <laughs> it's no, no color in the screen. It was still green and black. So that was, I think, I was measuring the body temperature while I was doing some sort of exercise at school. And yeah, that's another thing. I was sleeping a lot in high school because I was just so tired. <laughs> But I survived, and I actually wrote an article in our school newspaper about how to sleep in class <laughs> and get away with it from the teachers. And my teacher actually said I was very brave to do that. <laughs> so when it came to university, I did medical science as a degree because I was really interested in the science behind medicine, but I did not want to be a doctor because I didn't want to deal with all that stress of being a doctor. So at UNSW, they offer medical science, which is pretty much your foundation science knowledge for people who do medicine, as well as a lot of the biolo biology stuff. So you learn about microbiology, immunology, which is quite fun. And then I did my honors in molecular biology. So a summary of what my honors thesis was, basically, if you look at the right hand side, you take a bit of contaminated water and I can find out whose poo is in this water. So whether the poo came from the cow, a poo came from the dog, or a poo came from the human. And that's through something called, called microbial source tracking. So basically what I did was I head down to the beach, collected some water from something looking like this, and then you filter the water out and you can actually extract the DNA that's in the water from specific bacteria that I was looking at. And then you run it through something called PCR, polymerase chain reaction, and you amplify the segments. And then if there's the poo that you're looking for, essentially there's gonna be a huge increase in, in the water. So what I found out is there is a reason why there are stormwater, maybe polluted signs near stormwater exits, because after it's been raining really hard in Sydney, Coogee is actually a little bit polluted in terms of poo <laughs> from human. So don't swim near the stormwater exits after it rains, because it actually has a lot of poo in it. So handed my thesis in, got first class <laughs> honors in that, and I actually handed my thesis in on a Friday and started work on a Monday which I don't suggest, you should actually take a bit of a break. It's a bit full on to go straight from one thing into another. Um, so I had my graduation, I looked a lot happier this time mm -hmm. compared to the first time I was at UNSW for graduation. Um, so a little bit about Bioline, which is where I'm working now. It's known as the PCR company, which is polymerase chain reaction. I won't go into the detail of all these, but this basically this is what PCR is. So there's enzymes, it's a way to replicate DNA, um, you can ask me about these later, <laughs> so I won't bore you with a science lesson. And that was me, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed in the lab. I was showing off my lab coat because I had my name on it. Mm -hmm. And I was so excited because I could work on this R&D project. I started, off, I started off in the lab at Bioline, and I got to grow plants, and I was going to design a way to extract DNA from these plants. 
uh, in just one step instead of having to do it as two separate steps in amplifying it. But as you will learn in science, it doesn't always work. So this is how it felt like to me after a year. <laughs> Some days it works, some days it just nothing shows up. Other days you're like, what the hell happened here? But you just go in and you try it all again. And in the end you get your results. But it wasn't really for me because I could only deal with so much pain <laughs> and blank sheets of gel. So what Bioline did was, because we're actually a really small company, they saw how I sort of knew how everything worked at Bioline. So when it came, to the point where the company was growing, they needed someone to make sure everything else in the company was working well. So they put me in charge of quality assurance, which means this. So in a company, because we sell things to other customers, you want to make sure that what you're selling, what the customer thinks they're buying, what you're telling them that they're going to buy, and what you're actually making is all on the same page, because a lot of times it isn't. And that's a really good comic I've seen, found that sort of describes how things can fall apart when no one's on the same page. Um, so quality assurance is also a little bit of making sure your documentation is correct so you don't end up with situations like that where you're thinking you're summoning a demon but you actually get a lemon. So good documentation practice is very important. I also have to deal with um, complaints. So when a customer says, oh, something's not working, a lot of times it's like, have you read the uh, instructions that we gave you? 90% of the time, no, we haven't. Like, we, give, we put it in there for a reason. So hence the theoretical complaint department. A lot of times it's actually not a real complaint, it's just someone hasn't read the instructions. But um, when it is a real complaint, you have to do a lot of ev evidence digging up to find out what's gone wrong, why is this product not working? And I find it fun, some people don't. Um, maybe that's why I'm in quality assurance and other people aren't. Because I really like getting to the root of all these issues. I think someone's phone is ringing. Okay, and another thing is with college, it's all about compliance because we're not just, it's not just a company's rule that you have to, to abide by, especially when you're dealing with customers. It's also international regulations, um, government regulations. So compliance is key and it's not just because someone's checking in on you. You should really go with that customer focus that you're giving them the best product. And another bonus of being in quality assurance is because Bioline's a global company, um, I've gotten a chance to travel the world to our different sites. So I've been to our office in London um, in winter, which was really cold. I've also been to Berlin, which was also very cold. <laughs> and my favorite was actually going to Singapore because I was in charge of quality assurance over in Singapore and it was just a food eating trip each time I went. <laughs> and yeah, I smashed all that food and I looked pregnant afterwards. <laughs> but it was so worth it. So with science, you think about how it's all just going to be limited to being inside a lab or being inside the office. It's not. There's a whole new world out there. So through being at Bioline, I've managed to go to different conferences where I've gotten to talk to customers. I've been on panels, being able to share my knowledge and my experiences with the next generation of scientists. I've been taking part in projects. So this is Project XX, which is run by Cicada Innovations, which is uh, in Sydney. And they actually have win they've got programs based for women in science as well. So they're trying to help, because it's like Lisa was talking about earlier, you don't really think about science as being a women dominated thing, but you'd be surprised that in where I work in Cicada Innovations, Bioline's 90% female. There's another company who is probably 95% female. Almost everyone there is female, and they're actually a big IVD company. So it's just sort of going out there and getting these experiences. Um, yeah, so get to use your sort of problem solving skills to come up with really cool Halloween costumes. <laughs> so that was just all stuff we had lying around in the lab, lab coats, coat hangers, packing material, a bit of a red food that I was allowed to buy. And you have, I can also use it like playing sports because I'm always problem solving, trying to think of ways to make things better. So what better place than to do it on a footy field when you're trying to run away from other people and mm -hmm. score a goal. And that's it about me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tiffany. All right, we're gonna move on. Actually, let's get this break. Ooh, or not. Ooh. There we go. Is that your first? There's your first slide. Uh, sorry, I'm I, I, I hope I didn't give a good, a big reveal there. Um, we're gonna invite <laughs> up our next speaker, uh, who's Rosie Steinberg. 
um, who is a PhD candidate at UNSW. So let's welcome Rosie. Hello everybody, I'm Rosie, and I have not gone the straight path to uh, getting into a science uh, career. I didn't go high school, uni, masters, or honors, and then PhD, I went all over the place. But there has been one thread that's kind of been a constant through my whole life, and that is that I'm really obsessed with animals. Uh, when I was growing up, I had dogs and cats, I had rats, I had mice, I had centipedes, I had uh, like stingrays, I've had tons and tons of fish, tons of corals, and these are the things that I really loved, but definitely I, had a, I still have a huge dog obsession, and because of that, I was really convinced that I wanted to be a veterinarian. How many of you know exactly what you want to do right now for the rest of your life? When I was th 3 to 16, I knew I wanted to be a veterinarian, maybe even longer than that. 3 to 20, I wanted to be a veterinarian. Clearly that didn't work that way, because now I'm here. But my first step to trying to figure out whether vet life was right for me was to work at an animal shelter. Um, so I worked at Animal Humane New Mexico as an adoptions advisor, which means that I help people pick out the right animal for them, which was really fun and really rewarding and really stressful. But I started that when I was 16. I was in high school, um, and I was working one day a week, and I absolutely loved it. And because of that, I decided I wasn't even going to go to uni. I was going to stay at that shelter for the rest of my life, and I was going to work there forever and ever. So I didn't even apply. I didn't even look at unis. I just stayed. Uh, and I worked there for a year full time and found out that it's really, really hard to do something that emotionally taxing for that long. But that made me think that maybe I did want to go to uni, because maybe I could help animals, but without having to be that drained all the time. Seriously, people who can work at an animal shelter forever are very strong people. So I went to uni. I went to the University of New Mexico. That's the uh, main library. That's what the whole university looks like. Um, and I went into the biology department. So in the States, it's a little bit different than here. Um, veterinary school, If I, that's what I, did, I still decided I was going to be a veterinarian. You have to go to undergrad, and then you go to vet school after. So a little different. So I went for a pre-veterinary degree. But while I was there, they had a course in mammalogy, which is the study of mammals. And that changed my life entirely. And the reason it did that is because it was the first time I ever got to do field work. And I was totally hooked. I got to go out and go camping in the mountains and like, get to you know, experiment and run my own projects. It was so much fun. And I also got to prepare museum specimens, which was a little gross, but also really fun. So uh, I prepared some of those that are on the table there. But because of that, I, was like, I decided that I wanted to try out actually having a full project. So I did an honors, which in the States is a little different, but you still run your own project. Um, so I went into the bird department. And what I learned from this is I don't really like birds that much. <laughs> they're OK. They're pretty. But they didn't fascinate me. But I really liked the work. I didn't like the, su the subjects, but I really, really liked the work. And so what I did is that I decided that I was going to go and study abroad and have an adventure. So this is in Australia. I went up uh, to far north Queensland. I stayed around Cairns. Um, so these are Bujumbilla National Park and Orpheus Island, uh, which are absolutely amazing places. And this is probably the most fun I've ever had in my entire life. I was in school. So it was real school. It was really hard. It was a lot of work. But it was so exciting to go like hiking and snorkeling and we did our own science experiments, and we did some restoration and regeneration projects, and a lot of weeding of invasive species. But it was so fun. Everyone should go for a study abroad. It's super amazing. But I didn't have a plan for what I was going to do after that. Uh, knocking this thing over. So I went back home, and I got a job at a pet store, because it seemed like fun. And it was. Um, but it wasn't very fulfilling for me. It wasn't really what I wanted to do forever. And it really solidified my idea that, you know, I don't want to be a veterinarian anymore. I do want to do research. I do want to work with animals, but probably I don't want to sell them to people. Even though it was a really great place to work. 
And so from that, I decided that what I was going to do is I was going to go, to, I was going to go back to school, and I was going to do it in Australia. So I contacted the most amazing woman, um, Lynn Van Herwarden. She's a professor uh, at James Cook University. I met her on my study abroad. And I just sent her an email and said, hey, we talked during the study abroad. Do you have any projects? And she did. So I got to go to James Cook University, one of the best universities for tropical coral reef studies. And I got to work on the cutest anemone fish in the whole wide world, which is the wide-banded anemone fish. And if you're wondering how that's pronounced, it's Amphiprion latizanatus. And what I did is I looked at the little baby fish. Because adult fish, especially for uh, an enemy fish, they stay in one place their whole lives. So when things live on multiple reefs, it usually means that it's the babies that are going around. So I looked at the larvae of these fish, and I was kind of tracking how they moved between the different reef sites. Some of these are over 600 kilometers apart. And what I found was that most of the babies went back to the reef they were born at. So you can see that with the arrows that go back to themselves on the circles and also where you've got uh, red spots on the heat map, was just that that was all of the ones that were coming back to where they came from. And that was really important for conservation because this species is only found in this teeny tiny little area. So after that, I went back home again, and I decided to enroll in a maps master's, which I didn't finish. And it's actually okay to not finish things as long as you have a plan for what you're doing after. I absolutely adore math. Math is one of my favorite things in the whole wide world. But it wasn't something that I found gave me the kind of passion that biology did. I, was, I decided I was going to be modeling biological systems, but I wasn't going out and I wasn't doing the work myself, and that wasn't what was kind of getting my passion. Uh, and so this is actually my very favorite mathematical system. They're really cool. It's a strange attractor. If anyone wants to ask me about them later, I'll be happy to answer any questions. So what I did was I applied for a PhD, and that's where I am now. And I have found exactly where my passion is for science. I love weird corals. That's my thing. So I work on uh, soft corals here in Sydney, mostly. Um, so the first picture there is actually from Bear Island. And so this is my study species, these pretty pink fluffy cauliflowers. Uh, they have seahorses living in them. They have all kinds of other things living in them. So I'm trying to understand how important they are to the ecology. So basically how the animals and the uh, environment interact with each other. And I'm trying to see how animals use them as habitat. And something that's really cool that just came up last week, uh, I'm actually going to be going to Lord Howe Island on Monday. And I'm super excited. There's a heat wave happening right now. If anyone's noticed that the Sydney water feels like a bath, same heat wave is bothering uh, the animals at Lord Howe Island. So I'm going to go up uh, and find out how this is affecting corals and other animals in that area. And that's the really amazing thing about science is that it's really unpredictable. If something comes up, especially natural sciences, the natural world is weird. It does all kinds of weird stuff. There's heat waves, there's storms. And as soon as they happen, if you're the person who's studying it, you're going to go out there. You can go to the most amazing places. So if you're weirdly indecisive like I am, and that's fine, you can make it, then the best thing to do is to experiment. Find out what you want to do. Try all the different things. Go work at a pet shop if you think you might want to do that. Why not? But also, maybe ask your teachers and your professionals. That you, uh, anyone you like about volunteer opportunities. That's how I got most of my fieldwork experience, was just going to a lecture, deciding I like the professor, and then asking them if they had a spot for me. And they almost always did. Study abroad, for sure. It's really amazing. And then talk to your friends about what they're interested in, because they probably have ideas you've never even thought of. And don't be afraid to jump around a bit, because it's the only way you're going to be able to learn what you're interested in. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much, Rosie. Um, before we go to the next talk, we've got a really quick, um, I'm going to ask you to come up with some ideas. So if you haven't been thinking yet, I, though I'm sure you have, you're going to be asked to come up with some words. So everyone from, um, let's see, Rosie to the left out in the audience, you're going to think of words that describe science that start with the letter F. Got it? So that's you all over here. Words that describe science that start with the letter F. Panelists, I'm going to ask you to come up with words that describe science 
that start with the letter U. Let's see, can we predict the letter that I'm going to ask you guys to use? N. Okay, so what are words that describe science that start with F, U, I gave the panelists the hard one, uh, and N. All right, so we have words in mind. Can I hear some F words? Just call them out. <laughs> Y'all know what I mean. Some appropriate F. Flexible, great. Fun. Fun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Obviously. Any others? Field work. Field work. Great one. Fant Fascinating. Fascinating. Fantastic. Fantastic. These are all such great words. All right. So thank you. These are all great. How about some U words, panelists? Useful. Useful. Ubiquitous. Ooh, ubiquitous. <laughs> Fancy. <laughs> <laughs> Digging deep for these U words. Universal. Universal. All right. Any others? We're good. Useful? Yes. All right. How about N? Nice. New. Unknown. Ooh, that sneeze sticking in a K in there. Knowledge. <laughs> One more. Sorry. Never ending. These are great. All right, so these words all describe science, and that's because science truly is fun, right? And I think so far we've heard it two great talks about how science past can be so amazing and fun. We're going to bring it back and bring up our third uh, speaker for today, who is Elizabeth uh, C., from, who is a territory account executive at SAS Analytics. So welcome, Elizabeth. Thanks, Lisa. Can I just get a quick hand? Who's in your senior year here? Year 11 and 12. Yep, yep. Who's in year 9 and 10? Wow. <laughs> and um, anyone in the grades below 9 or 10? No? Okay. That's good, that's good. Um, just so I know who, what the kind of audience I'm talking to. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to step you through... Um, a couple of, I, I think you would call them um, main events in my career so far. Um, offer you some career advice as well. Um, hopefully that'll be helpful, um, given that you're towards the end or middle of your high school journey and looking, looking to see what to do next. Um, and hopefully give you some um, little bits of insight that you can take forward. So any questions, just raise your hand. Um, so I'm a territory account executive, that probably doesn't mean much to any of you. <laughs> um, it just means that I consult uh, on the business side, so I talk to business leaders about their data and analytics um, strategy going forward. So although um, I am analytical and science minded, I don't wear a lab coat, um, sometimes I wear a suit, sometimes I wear jeans, um, but I essentially go out and speak to businesses about what they can understand from their data and what they can do next. So if anyone is online, on Instagram, on Netflix, on Facebook, on Snapchat, that's all data. And businesses these days really want to understand what you guys are up to and how they can um, sell something to you or make your life a little bit better in some cases. All right. Uh, so I'm going to start with my interests. Um, so in high school, I was really interested in biology. And I feel like that comes from individuals. So I was studying, you know, people, behavior, um, psychology. Um, and I guess the next thing was I was interested in groups and interactions. How did these people interact? And that means that I was really interested in physics as well. So how do systems interact with one another? And experiences created. So given um, a single unit, how does it interact in a system? And what's the experience created? I think that is my underlying interest. And it wasn't that clear when I was in high school. Um, only after a few years out of high school that I've worked that out. But I'll come back to this later on. In school, these are some of the subjects that I studied. Uh, like I said, I really loved physics and, and biology. I was actually the only student that took that, cor that uh, matching of course. Uh, a lot of people did chemistry and physics or biology and physics. So the point here is to don't be afraid to try something that's a little bit different. Um, and, and PE, I love doing sports. I loved um, being on the field, running around, and I'm a little bit competitive as well. 
Um, at school, I mean, sorry, at university, I applied to study um, engineering and business. Uh, business was a degree that I just kind of tacked on and thought, oh, it's only an extra year, I guess I can do it. Um, haven't done too much of it in, um, in high school. And part of the engineering degree, I had to do some um, internships, so practical work. So I would say once you're in university, make sure, like um, some of our panellists have said, um, experiment. So try different fields, um, try different um, faculties and see if you can get some hands-on um, experience. Some advice, maybe take a gap year if you're not sure. One year um, is not really not that long in the grand scheme of things and sometimes a break straight after high school, it's just what you need. Uh, bridging courses. So if you feel like you're not you know, at the level of advanced maths, the university does offer bridging courses. Um, so if you're not ready, there's always help. Um, summer school, this is what I did. I did summer school. I felt, I think it was three months of a break and I thought, what am I going to do for three months? <laughs> so to alleviate the load of uni studies, I did summer school. Um, and it means that you get a different taste of, of university as well. You do it nine to five for, I think it was a couple of weekends instead of it spread out over 13 weeks. So it's very condensed. Um, electives. So if you have an interest in something like languages, take an elective in languages. It will really, really benefit you um, in a couple of years' time. Um, it also gives you a different way of thinking about how to solve um, different business problems or different scientific problems. Um, exchange, someone else here again mentioned um, about studying abroad. Another thing, see if you can build your network, get a little bit more uh, diversity. We hear it a lot um, in the STEM fields. And volunteer work, put your, put your uh, foot out there, um, volunteer for different events, um, different, again, different faculties. There's, there's different faculties like law, um, engineering, of course, business. Try and see if you can find your little niche, because at the end of the day, we're always trying to find, hmm, something fits, but it's a little bit too big or it's a little bit too small. Um, I think the only way to overcome that is to make sure that you gain as much experience as you can in uni. Any questions so far? This might be a, t a topic at everyone's front of head at the moment. No? Okay, I'll move on. Talking about experiences, clubs and, univers uh, clubs and communities. Um, find a group where you've got like-minded people. So I joined Engineers Australia and that was really insightful because it gave me an understanding of what the engineering industry was like. Um, at university, you just do coursework, but sometimes you want to know, okay, if I'm going to get into science, what is the scientific field like? Maybe you attend a museum, for example, um, and understand what kind of work they do day to day. Um, here I've got some examples of, this is the engineering camp that I went on. I think I think they put us in that because they thought we couldn't make friends with each other because engineers don't have very good social skills, but I beg to differ. <laughs> um, that was a volunteer event there. Um, another one was with the Engineering Society. Um, that com comes up again with my passion for sports. Um, and that there was a public speaking event um, with Engineers Australia. So again, make sure you try and find um, a community where you feel like you belong and you've got some like-minded friends. Speaking about internships, um, so I did a, an internship at a hospital, part of a biomedical engineering um, firm, where I was looking after medical devices and I was making sure that they were functioning properly. Uh, for example, in a NICU, so that's the um, intensive care unit for newborn babies, they need to make sure that all the machinery there is running. So, for example, the humidifier um, is the environment that the baby in, in is it um, cultivating their growth? And if not, we, we really need to fix that because young babies are really sensitive. Uh, my second internship was at ANSTO, and that's the nuclear science research facility here in Australia. It's the only one here. Um, again, my passion of physics and biology clearly evident there, um, first in the biomedical um, internship and then physics in um, at Ansto. So these two industries gave me a really good um, insight into into the type of work that I will be doing day to day. So again, try and find um, some practical work. 
And then I found that, you know what, this is all really, really great, but what does it actually mean? How does it apply to businesses? How does it make change? And that's what led me to SAS. SAS is a data science uh, global, um, a global company where we help businesses understand their data and make better use of it. So this is the Global Academy. I was fortunate enough to attend an international program um, with, as you can see, people from all different backgrounds. This is um, people from Philippines, from the US, from Spain, from Germany, um, Hungary and Belgium. You get the point. It's pretty much everyone from almost every industry and that was a really great experience. Um, and there I got my first look on onto how to interact with businesses. Um, how do I make sure that I can decipher the current problems and help them through it um, using data and, and analytics? So I felt my I feel that my time at SAS really honed in on my interest of understanding understanding people's motivations and decision making, um, and also supported by data. What I'm going to show you next is a framework that you can use yourself. You can take it um, today and have a think about where you want to go. So this is sort of an adaptation of, uh, I guess, what's called the Simon Sinek um, circle of why. What I've got here is you. And you are the centre of all of this. You have to own your career path because no one else is going to do it for you. You have to find your support network and your mentors. So what I've got here is you. Try and find your interest. Your interest could be very, very sort of out of the blue, um, left of field, but it doesn't matter. As long as that's what's going to motivate you and drive you. And then find out why. why what do you want to do with what your motivations are, what your interests are? And that, I guess, forms the foundation of where you're going to go. So start with you, start with why. And then think about the steps of how to get there and ultimately what you want to do. Because at the end of the day, you guys are in this very fast paced industry where your job that you want to do probably doesn't even exist yet. So you might have to make it yourself. Or the job that you want now might not even exist in five to 10 years time, especially in the um, IT software field. So I'm going to show you an example how to apply this. So let's say that Sally, Sally was with her family, she visited Nepal and she really loved the experience, she loved the different taste of cultures and different foods there. And then she saw that there was a Nepal earthquake that happened. And then she thought, you know what, I really want to help nations in disaster zones. How do I do that? I'm going to take up a humanities and computer science degree because at the end, end of the day I want to help people who are struggling in disaster zones. And then what does that mean? She could become an environmentalist. That, that's a bit of editing font there. But um, you, you get the point. The point is to look at your motivations, what you like to do. So I hope that gives you a bit of insight or some kind of framework to apply. Wrapping back, when I mentioned that I liked um, individuals, groups, interactions and experiences, I'm now doing my postgraduate studies in behavioural economics. So as you can see, it is a science um, in psychology um, that Lisa had mentioned, um, and it's not the most direct path to get there. I tried very different um, ways to get there and put yourself out there and, and, ex and experiment a little. So that's me. If you've got any questions, you can come find me afterwards. All right, thanks so much. Um, without further ado, um, we're actually going to move on to our next speaker, um, who's Kat Bendel, PhD candidate at UNSW. So let's welcome Kat. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, yeah, I'm Kat, and um, I'm from Germany originally, and um, from Berlin, Germany. And um, yeah, so we're a bit going back to what um, Rosie talked about. So it's all about animals again, not so much computers, I'm afraid. All animals. So um, yeah, so I did high school in Berlin and um, I was always interested in animals, wanted to understand their biology a bit better and I always liked science. So 
um, yeah, so the question was, what are I going to do with that? And um, for me, it was pretty logical at that point. I did a vet degree. So, um, <laughs> so I'm actually a vet and um, I really liked it. I did my undergrad degree in Berlin. Um, it's, it's great, but it was also a lot of work. It's a very hard degree and enjoyable at times, not so enjoyable at others when, um, when it's exam time. Um, yeah, and then I also realized that obviously being a practical vet is great, but I was more interested in, sci uh, in science or in research. So to find out if I really like research and um, to also satisfy the urge to go and travel, um, I went to Australia and did a, for the very first time, and did a research internship at the University of Melbourne at the vet school there. And um, it was actually a project on the gut parasites of kangaroos, a bit messy, but pretty good. I really liked it. And I also used the opportunity to experiment as well, uh, quite a bit as well. So what I did, am I using this correctly? <laughs> I have a feeling yeah. I'm getting too close. Yeah. 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 All right. Okay, um, right, so I also used the opportunity to help out with um, lots of research projects. I went out on field work and um, yeah, helped out other PhD students who did a project on dolphins, for example, um, studied the behavior of dolphins or um, mis misnetting of birds and all different kind, kinds of, um, of projects, really, and I quite enjoyed that. And I, of course, got an opportunity to travel around the country and um, this is a beautiful country and it was great to get to know it. So I did realize during this internship that I really liked um, research and I wanted to um, follow, follow up on that path. So what I did um, next was I moved to beautiful Switzerland. Um, for everyone who hasn't been, it is very beautiful. And um, yeah, so I did a master's by research there. And um, so I had quite a few very interesting um, study animals, so the one, <laughs> there you it's go. back, yeah, it's back. Yeah, problem solving, yeah. there you yeah. go. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so I actually did a project which was a two-year degree in Switzerland on um, the digest digestive tract of certain mammals and um, these mammals were all part of the fun, so in the very upper left corner we have the South American Viscacha. Um, then the sloth, of course, I'm sure all of you would know it. And the very um, left corner is a Flemish giant rabbit. Great animals as well. Um, and the study was about, as I said, um, their, uh, the functioning of their digestive tract, but also their methane production. I'm sure you've all heard about methane being a quite a nasty greenhouse ga gas, and we know a lot about how much, um, especially cattle or ruminants in general, how much methane they produce, and that's quite devastating for our climate. And um, so in this study, it was about, what about the other mammals? So what kind of digestive tract do you have to have in order to produce less or more methane? So. That was very interesting. I got to travel a lot um, to different zoos in Germany and Switzerland to do my studies. And um, as basically highlight of my master's degree, I came back to Australia and um, did uh, spent 10 months in the outback at a research station and did that study on kangaroos. So again, how much methane do um, kangaroos produce? Should we rather eat kangaroos and just skip sheep and cattle? The, the answer is yes, that would be great. But um, not everyone is convinced of that. But eat those kangaroo sausages. It's good for the environment. <laughs> um, um, all right. So then, yeah, because I realized that I really do like research still. Um, and I enjoyed the whole journey. Like, not like the work as such, of course. Like, um, getting results, writing them up and ideally finding something that might be useful for society. Um, yeah, so I wanted to, want, still wanted to follow up on that. And uh, because I really liked Australia as well, I came back to Australia um, to do my PhD at UNSW. And that's what I'm doing at the moment still for another six more months. And um, yeah, so my project still is on whales and their bacteria. 
So um, I moved up in, in size when it comes to mammals. Um, and I'm working mostly with humpback whales. Um, who of you have, um, have like seen humpback whales off the coast of Sydney? Oh, cool, quite a few. So for, I guess for someone who grew up in Sydney, that might not be very special, but I'm from a landlocked city. Berlin might be exciting, but it doesn't have whales, that's for sure. So uh, for me, it was actually super exciting to come here and just go to the, to the coast, to the headlands and watch whales. So that's just quite amazing. And um, yeah, so my project is basically about um, the bacteria the whales have in their, um, in their spray or blow, like whatever comes out of their blowhole when they exhale. That little cloud um, looks like lots of water droplets, but it's actually full of bacteria as well, which is not a bad thing. Lots of bacteria can be very useful, especially those we have in our, in our digestive tract, but even in our airways, we have lots of bacteria that are probably also very useful. Um, not much is known about that, actually. So I had to collect the, the blow of the whales. And because um, I always get, or I get asked a lot, how do you collect whale blow? There you go. So um, you have, oh, hang on. Um, you have, um, or I had two different options. One was um, with a long pole with petri dishes at the end, which is in the upper picture. And I was on um, whale watching boats every day. And um, basically I was running around the boat, trying to catch the right moment when the whale would come up right next to the boat. And then I would stick out that pole and get a bit of that, those droplets that came out of the whale. And um, the other more fancy version, of course, is using a drone and flying that drone, the red one, um, flying that drone over the whale. It's a bit tricky, but it's good fun, as you can imagine. Yeah, so um, that whole project, um, so far I've really enjoyed that journey as well. It is, um, it obviously brought me to amazing places. So I did my field work in Harvey Bay for those ones of you who have been, it's quite a beautiful place and lots of whales around. And um, yeah, and um, a PhD involves um, not only field work, it also involves data analysis, as we have already heard, and um, lots of communication. You have to communicate to everyone involved, like people who own the, uh, or who yeah, own the whale watching boats, the tourists who are on the whale watching boats. So it involves like a whole lot of skills I was able to develop there. So it's quite um, universal, really. Um, yeah, but I also want to mention that, um, of course, it's not all about your academic interest. I mean, that is very, definitely very important. But as we have heard before from Rosie or from Elizabeth, um, you're more than just your job, right? So um, I'm sure every one of you have, um, has lots of interests and um, I find them really important as well. Um, so I love scuba diving, which is also great in Sydney. Um, I've, um, I've done martial arts for quite a long time and um, for a bit more than a year, I'm involved in a radio show here in Sydney, a science radio show. And all these things um, are really important because they also help us to learn who we are. They might make life fun and interesting. So again, I can only repeat um, what the other speakers said before me, just go out there, experiment. And if you tr don't try new things, you don't know if they are for you or not. So yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kat. Um, so we're about to invite our final speaker, uh, but certainly last but not least, of course, uh, this is Ashley Harrington, um, who is uh, the expo coordinator and educator at the Australian Museum. Have any of you guys been to the Australian Museum? Yeah, quite a few of you. So we have a unique opportunity to hear from her. So let's welcome Ashley. Thank you so much guys, it's actually a pleasure to be here today because I am really happy to share my almost accidental journey into science communication. Um, like the lady said here, they've had lots of different science um, interests. We actually look at every single one of those facets for our job, so it's very, very cool. Um, so just a little snapshot of myself, I am an absolute history nerd. I love the outdoors, but I have become a museum enthusiast who is incredibly passionate about accessible science. So, 
my journey was a little bit late into science. I didn't realize the relevance um, and just how amazing it was until very late in life. It didn't quite click for me very early on. I was a very curious child. I was a persistent asker of why, but it didn't just quite click. I did a broad range of HSC subjects, which included an accelerated HSC dance course, and it also included biology, P, and mathematics. But at this stage in my life, everything revolved around dancing. There was nothing else, even all the anatomy that I absolutely loved that I learned in P and biology, linked it back to dance. That's all that was my focus. I almost had blinders at this point in my life to science. But then fast forward ahead to my undergraduate days and it started to click but not quite just yet. So I started off with a degree um, at Macquarie University, so a Bachelor of Arts majoring in Rome, Greece and late antiquity. And then in my second year of uni I discovered this really obscure course called Museum Studies. So I decided to add a Museum Studies major, double it up, why not, it sounded really, really cool and then throw in a minor in anthropology, an obsession for archaeology units, and a sprinkling of science units, and I had a slightly left of field, but reasonably well-rounded degree. So there were two, oops, sorry, there was two major parts in my undergrad that um, kind of shaped my future career path. So the first was my archaeological dig that I got to do in Menorca, just off Spain, um, so that was amazing. So that's where it all kind of fell into place for me, that um, realisation of the integration and relevance of science in our everyday lives. So that was amazing. Um, we often get taught our subjects in isolation um, at school and in primary school and high school, um, but the reality is that they're quite interconnected in, real, um, in everyday life, so we need to keep that in mind. It's really important to remember. So we actually got to work on a 5th, 6th century AD Roman site, which was amazing, called Senacera. So we excavated the city site and the necropolis and were working with disarticulated skeletons. So that was quite cool. There were a lot of amazing takeaways from such an experience and the views weren't too bad either. We were by the ocean, so that was fantastic. Um, and we met an amazing group of people. But the big thing about this trip was that it was a really beautiful example of the integration between science and culture. So that was incredible to be able to do. And then the second thing that happened in my undergraduate degree, I was discovering something called science communication. Has anybody heard of science communication before? Put your hands up if you have. No? Yeah, I didn't either. No, I had no idea what science communication was. Hadn't really had an interest in science before this point until I realised in archaeology we were doing a lot of geological principles, we were doing anatomy, um, we were looking at where pottery came from based off the clay types and the composition types and the inclusions as well. So this was all really new to me, realising just how incredible science is. Um, so science communication found it, had no idea what it was, was about to discover that. So there were two people that helped me discover this in my life and that was my museum studies major convener who was beautiful and said keep your passions with you, which I think is such a beautiful thought. And the lady, lovely ladies before me have mentioned that as well. Um, and he also said, don't wait until your degree is over, volunteer now, just go out and do it. Absolutely, just go do it now. And he was very, very insistent on that point. I'm really glad I listened to him. And then the second is actually sitting at the back and is my current manager um, for SciComm. And she discovered my raw skill sets and my enthusiasm quite early on and gave me a bit of a chance to develop those and grow those. Um, she also careered me into the world of science communication, so that, you know, crash course in what, what it actually is, which is fantastic. So over the years I've been working in science communication, we've developed such a broad skill set, such a broad skill set, things I didn't even know that I would get to experience. So we do event management, we do stakeholdership, we do content program development. So I've done blown up volcanoes, I've done CSI forensics workshops, We've had goo, bits of goo everywhere, ended up covered in the end of the day by squid juices, um, strawberries and methylated spirits. It's a fun, fun job, smelly job, but it's fun. Um, so that was really fantastic. And one of the big ones which these ladies have also mentioned is problem solving. So the thing about working science communication and science education events is that you don't actually get to go in a corner and sit and stew over all your decisions that you're about to make or worry about making the wrong decisions. You just don't have time for that. You really don't. You have someone right in front of you expecting a decision, whether it be your exhibitors, your presenters, or the kids that you're working with. They expect you to make a decision on the spot. So we got really, really good at, you know, bluffing, but also problem solving on, at the time. So we got really good at that. 
Um, also, obviously, communications. Uh, we got really good at speaking to people, which is fantastic. And I've also had opportunities to pass on my experience and my knowledge to our beautiful interns that come through as well. So we have museum studies, education and science interns. We also get to work with a range of different companies like AMSTO, Engineers Australia, UNSW, so a range of different scientific institutions across the board, across Sydney. So it's really, really a fantastic group of people. Now, we do get a really broad skill set but what I've looked, um, decided and realised looking back upon is we tend in school and in our early careers to focus on what we're good at. So we say we're good at science, we're good at maths, we're good at English. But the reality is that there's actually so many skills that are really transferable across different fields. So it's really important to remember that and to not restrict ourselves to you know, placing us in science, or English. Sometimes we're quite good at elements of both of them. So it's a really good exercise. Um, very early on in your career to actually dig deep and um, see if you can identify those underlying skills that you've got because it's really good for the confidence but it's also good to start getting comfortable with what you're capable of as well. So the last chapter in my career has opened up not only professional opportunities but an opportunity to you know, be innovative and really proactive about increasing the scientific literacy and confidence in the students that we see through our science festival. So you can see it's lots of fun there. Um, but what we get to do is, moving more into operations, is we get to provide opportunities for kids to have that really entry level engagement for science. And I'm in a really unique, beautiful position that because of my journey, because I haven't come from a very, very heavy science background, and because I discovered very science very late in life, I actually have a really good perspective on how to get these kids engaged because they might not have yet explored science, they might not have had the opportunity to do so, they might not even have thought that computer science is a science or forensics is a science or a myriad of other activities that they might not have thought of yet. So that's what it gives us opportunities to. It gives us access to an inspiring group of people as well, so scientists, educators, um, and science communicators that are amazing, inspiring, motivating people, and we get to provide those for the kids to see, all those beautiful stories from scientists about what they do and how they got there, which is really fantastic. And, you know, if you have drone simulations, you know, frisbee throwing robots, you have coding, you have live animals, how could you not get engaged with science with all that happening? It's actually really, really fun. And one of the things that our team really, really loves and one of my favourite parts is almost that gotcha moment. So you watch a kid come in, they're kind of like, eh, science, you know, never done it before, I don't want to do it, it's fine. And then you see them interact with, you know, a sparrow robot, or you see them doing a chemistry experiment, and their face absolutely lights up. And that's when we know that we've got them. You know, they've started to get excited about science, they're thinking more about it, and we know that we've done our job. So that's a really cool moment as well. And then that led me into being really, really passionate about accessible science. So science should be inclusive, it should be accessible to everybody. Um, so specifically for people with disability and low SES students um, are our focuses recently. And then we get to go out on the road as well. So we have really, really cool um, science on the road program. It's a condensed version of our city site. And we get to go everywhere. So this is just a really small snapshot of where we actually get to go. Um, but that's really beautiful because we get to go mostly New South Wales regional areas, but sometimes we creep up the border over to Queensland and we get to perform at um, the World Science Festival in Brisbane, which is also a lot of fun. And that's really important for me personally because I am a Wagga girl, proud and born and bred. So I really love the opportunity to give back to the community because you guys are really lucky because you're in Sydney. You have access to so many beautiful museums. I mean, we're in one of them. I'm from one of them. And you also have all these beautiful scientists that you can talk to, you can hear from. The country we do have opportunities, but just not as many. It's a little far to come up here. It's about five and a half hours, which is a really, really, really long car ride. Um, so it's really great to be able to give and perform these science content back to the community as well. So that's really, really a favorite part of my job. And then we also get to go over to international as well. And we get to jump on a plane and we get to try a hand at an international audience. So last year we got to go to the Croucher Foundation Science Week in Hong Kong. Um, it's very beautiful over there. And that was really amazing because we not only got to represent the Australian Museum, but we also got to represent Australian science communicators. We were the only Australian science communicators invited. 
So it was really lovely to represent our country and our institution, but also women in science, because everybody that went over happened to be female, which was fantastic. And that was a really lovely opportunity to see um, a different set of kids that we don't work with engage with science as well. And it was really great to put our work on a global stage. It's nice to know what else is out there as well. So we got to see a lot of international festivals. And they loved us so much that we're going back next year, which is fantastic. So I just want to leave you with a few things that I've learned about science is keep an open mind, guys. So think widely. Say yes to absolutely every opportunity. So I started off in volunteering. So when Kat gave me the opportunity, I was volunteering. I very quickly turned into a paid job purely because I was a very, very enthusiastic yes person. So it terrified me. I jumped in the deep end quite a bit. I knew Kat was there to help me and my colleagues were there to help me, but it was still terrifying. But that actually gave me more opportunities. And because of that, I had unintentionally fallen into this dream job that I had no idea existed before and all before I'd even finished my undergraduate degree. So that was a really amazing opportunity. Also create an inspiring and motivating network around you, your colleagues and your peers, your mentors, whoever you want in that network is really important. If you love your job, that's great. If you have other people around you who are also super passionate, that's even better. So remember to keep people in mind. You have lots of informal mentors, that's fantastic as you work through your early career and later as well. The other thing is to not disregard your previous experiences. So that catering job or that hospitality job that you've got, it's not unimportant. Coming into science communication, I realized I already had, you know, a raw skill set of communication skills. I was great at managing people because, you know, people can kind of get cranky when you have your meal come out. So you get really good at negotiating personalities and that's really important in stakeholder management. So please don't disregard your previous experiences. They're so, so important, okay? And I'll leave you with a little bit of a problem-solving mindset that we kind of use as well in our team is, so what, what now? So it's happened, you can't change the past. So w what's your next problem-solving? What, what options have you got now? And you know we've learned that because we don't have the time to stew over it for days and days and days. And then I'll also leave you with um, a really beautiful quote that is really apt for my science communication and science journey is you can't connect the dots looking forward you can only connect them looking backwards so you have to trust that the dots will connect somehow connect in your future okay so keep a really open mind say yes to as much as you possibly can and remember that science is often interrelated with other things so keep your passions going with you okay and if you want to hear about all the fun stuff we do with our team come ask me any questions later thank you All right, so we're about to open to questions. So you have two routes to do this. One, once you think of your question, we're gonna have two microphones and you can raise your hand, or if you'd prefer, you can enter your questions via Slido um, with the code there. But before we do any questions, I've got one more um, kind of thought activity. This is a game and it's called Before and After. So all you have to do is decide whether the thing I say happened before or after the date or the year I say. And you're gonna raise your hand if you think it's before and keep your hand down if you think it's after. So um, how about let's go with uh, the first female elected to the Australian Academy of Science. And the year that you're guessing before or after is 1950. So. Raise your hands if you think this happened before or after, before, sorry, uh, 1950. <laughs> a couple? All right. Well, and it turns out you guys are mostly very brilliant. It was after. Um, Dorothy Hill was our first female elected to the Australian Academy of Science in 1956 uh, for her work in geology and paleontology. Okay, so there's just two more. We'll see if you guys continue your good run. Uh, the first female to be admitted to a science degree in Australia and the year before or after 1930. Raise your hand if you think it was before. All right. One vote. All right. Uh, the answer, so the very, we flipped our tables here. The answer is before. The first female to be admitted to a science degree in Australia was Edith Dornwell at Adelaide University in 1883. 
Um, so I primed you there. <laughs> she was also actually the only science student admitted to the university at the time. So not only the first female, the first science student all up. Um, and she ended up graduating with first class honors. So a great, okay, so one final one. We'll see how you all go this time. The appointment of Australia's first women in STEM, so STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math, ambassador. So the appointment of Australia's first women in STEM ambassador before or after the year 2000. So raise your hand if you think it was before. Yeah. All right, ooh, we've got, a, we've got a torn audience here. What do you, you guys all think after? All right, the answer is after. Yay! <laughs> so who is it? Does anyone know who it is? Anyone on our panel know who it is? No? All right, this happened just last year, 2018, and it's Professor Lisa Harvey Smith. Um, so keep your eye out for her if you're on Twitter or I'm sure she's on Instagram. Check her out. She is doing amazing things, inspiring girls like you to think about what careers in STEM look like. So you now have heaps of questions. I can see them on Slido. Um, I'm going to ask the panelists as they're answering questions to make sure you use the mic so we can hear you. Make sure that's on. All right, so you're going to need to raise your hands nice and high um, so we can see you. Does anyone here have a, a mic question they want to ans ask? There's one. Um, what was the hardest thing you had to face, like each of you going into uni and going into a science degree or trying to find it? Was there like any inequalities or double standards because you're all women in science? Maybe we'll take two, two panelists to tackle this one. Yeah, no, that's a great question to ask. Um, I think for me, you saw the photo of the camp up there. The most daunting moment was when I walked into the camp shed. There was about three to 400 students. About, I think, there was only 10 girls out of 400 boys. Um, so that was really, really daunting to me. And I thought, what am I doing here? I don't, I don't think I belong. So I started questioning whether or not I should be doing this degree. Um, but I, I stuck to my guns, you know, don't be scared. Um, it's good to be different. Uh, women bring a different kind of mindset and uh, different qualities and different pros and cons um, to any discussion, I feel. Um, so even if you feel a little bit intimidated, if you have a good support network, um, you will get through it and it's it's those kind of things I think that you face ongoingly anyway It just so happens that I faced it first when I was in uni One other person want to tackle this question. Yeah, thank you um, I have a I guess the opposite experience because being in vet science and by now I know that this is basically the case all over the Western world they're mostly women in that degree. So it's rather the opposite that the men are, I wouldn't <coughs> say they're actually, they have a disadvantage. Often <laughs> they're actually quite happy to be one of the few, one of the few males. And um, there is some rumor that they are like, they have some advantages because the professors do want to make sure that they actually pass and not fail. So um, yeah, just trying to say the opposite can happen as well. and. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, as I said, those few men, they were, I think, quite happy. <laughs> Other audience uh, questions? Raise your hand nice and high. Me? I can't see the lights are in my face. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know how most of the panelists today have, like, multiple degrees that they've done, and, like, they're not necessarily, like, all the same kind of degree. I was just wondering, um, did you ever feel like one of the degrees or like one of the courses you've done was a waste of your time? Like, and is it okay that some of your degrees weren't actually used in your career right now? Good question. I can definitely speak to that uh, <laughs> since I did give up on one of them, which isn't <laughs> quite the right word, but it wasn't for me. But I don't think any of that was a waste of time. I think every single course I took, including the ones that were really hard and I was really bad at, were really, really helpful because I learned a lot about myself um, and also picked up problem-solving skill sets that I never would have. 
Um, and I took a maths course I was 100% not prepared for. And the thing that was really beautiful about taking that course was it was numerical analysis, which is really hard. And I had not taken the intro course to that. And I had classmates who were absolutely phenomenal. And we formed a study group and we kind of all shared our skills. So I've got good computer skills. Um, I know programming. I'm good at making a graph look beautiful. Uh, and so that was my main contribution, was making sure our homework was gorgeous and our teacher loved it. And their main contribution was teaching me all the math that I didn't understand. So learning how to handle those sorts of situations and also learning how to handle something that's very frustrating or something that you do feel is useless because it's not going to happen just once in your life. It'll happen a lot. These are good skills. Here and then, and then we'll go on. Yeah. So sort of on the same, so I didn't think any of my courses were sort of useless, but I did almost fail chemistry in uni. So I scraped by <laughs> with a 53%. I actually have no idea how I passed that course because half my exam was blank. And now I do molecular chemistry. So it's okay if it, like at uni or even high school, you fail a course. It just means, you, I don't think failure is a bad word because it means you actually try. And just because you don't, it might just be you don't get it in that format. I was not very good at tests, but then when it came to science, I was actually good at the report writing and the experiment parts. So don't think about, oh my god, I failed something. I, that's it. Like, I have to give up on that career path. It's just try again, because you might actually still get the chemistry or this concept. You just need to look at it a different way. Yeah, and as we pass the mic down, I think it's worth noting that sometimes actually doing the science that you might learn out of a textbook, it, those are totally different things, right? So while you may not love studying um, the content or practicing your maths problem, actually using those in your, in your career is a very different thing. So I actually don't get to use a whole lot of my degree that I did because I obviously jumped ship into science communication. Um, so I started off absolutely thinking I was going to go into education. So a lot of people were really actually quite condescending about my degree because it was very different. They were like, what are you going to do at the end of it? Um, me being as stubborn as I was, I was determined to get a job in museums and I'm in my sixth year now, so it's great. But even though I don't necessarily use all of the history knowledge and the archaeology that I've, and various other things that I've done within my degree, the skill set that got me into my job was from being at uni. So all the research skills was really great for me to be able to create content. The creativity I even brought from my dancing HSC was used for me to be able to be a bit more innovative when I was creating programs. And, and it's okay to fail. It's okay to make mistakes. Um, the thing is, we have all these beautiful successes and they should be celebrated, but at the same time, the areas where we actually learn the most and the things that are going to be most beneficial for our growth is where we make mistakes. Um, so never think of it as a waste of idea, think of it as a learning experience. Um, in hindsight, I probably, knowing everything I did now, I probably would have gone back and done a very different undergrad, but then I wouldn't have known Psycom as a degree, as an area of, of working. So just every experience is a great experience. Great. Um, Elizabeth, I'm going to throw this question to you from Slido. Um, what job do you think you would have if you weren't able to or didn't end up in your current job? So parallel universe you, what do you think you might be doing with your education or your experiences? Yeah, I like that question. I think about it a lot actually. What if? <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually love science, but I also love communicating it. So to, to your point, um, I think in a parallel universe, I would be a lecturer um, in science, probably in the social science stream. Um, I feel because I was heavily maths, uh, biology and physics, um, heavily interested in those in high school, it wasn't until I graduated from high school and uni that I felt, okay, but how does this apply to humanity? How does it apply to life, the lives that we live, so that it's enriched and um, it's not just about how long you live, but the quality of your life as well. How do we apply That's science to better that? Yeah. Awesome. Do we have um, more questions? We've got one here. Can I get a mic just there? Yeah. Um, what do you think the future holds for women in the science field? I think we're going to do amazing. I think we're going to have 50-50 representation in all of the underrepresented groups. Um, and continue to overrepresent the overrepresented groups because we're amazing and <laughs> we're going to be great. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, that did that question. <laughs>
So, so one thing I'll add to that is that there's a good amount of research showing that um, when women join a discipline, whether it's science or some other discipline that they don't often, um, aren't at what we call parity, it turns out that um, the discipline actually does a lot better. Uh, and people ask, why is it that women are more brilliant? Um, I mean, I do think that women are brilliant, but so are men. It turns out that what's really important is having a diversity of mindsets, a diversity of approaches. And if you're leaving, half of the world behind because you're not bringing women on board, then you're going to miss out on that. And that same logic applies to all sorts of different types of backgrounds. Um, so I think science will benefit from having women um, no matter what, simply because we bring unique perspectives to the table. Um, so I stole the answer to that one, sorry. Uh, all right, one more um, Slido question. Let's see. Um, a couple of you guys spoke about traveling, and there's a question on here about whether this is travel for work or whether it's kind of a personal drive for travel that you're able to satisfy for work. So does anyone want to talk about travel, science travel? So all of the overseas trips we've been able to do with our creek is for purely for our work and for our different audiences. So that includes traveling in Australia. We get invited to come down to those regional areas, which is really beautiful, but it just so happens that everybody else in the team has a passion for travel. So we do look and be proactive about, you know, engaging with internationals. It's about, it all comes back down to saying yes. If you see an opportunity for a collaboration or if you see an opportunity to be at a conference, just say yes, it's a great opportunity. It's a great opportunity to see science in different formats in different countries as well. I'll add to that as well and say that science is a highly, highly collaborative field. So whether or not you're a data scientist, you're going to be exchanging code with the person next to you. How did you solve this problem? What perspective did you take? Or if you're a PhD researcher like some of the, some of the girls on the panel, um, you're going to be writing papers, collaborating with different professors, different people, um, studying different aspects of the field that you're studying. Um, so that's, I think, really important to keep in mind. Although you've got your own personal goals, you also have to be sensitive to those of the groups that you're working with. Um, and also, if you're in the business side of things where you're applying science, like, like I am, um, I'm speaking to people in the US and people in Europe about how they're deploying um, analytics in different industries. So it's all about the versatility and the, I guess, cross-application cross of science as well. Great. Um, can, I, can I sling another question at you? Um, so someone, or anyone actually, um, someone is interested in um, the difference between a bachelor's and a PhD. And I wonder if anyone can succinctly answer that one. I only know the difference um, in terms of biology. So I mean, it mine's totally framed around that. It might be different in other places. Um, but a bachelor's is going, taking courses, writing papers. Maybe you get to do some independent research, but it'll be short and, and, and smaller. Uh, whereas a PhD is independent, you're self-motivated. No one's going to you know, find out. No one's going to hold you to a deadline um, in any way that's got serious consequences, except maybe you know, paying for your degree. So it's all on you. You have to build your own project. Um, oftentimes you have to get your own funding. So it's, I guess it's more, it's more responsibility, but it's also a lot more freedom and a lot more flexibility. Yeah. I didn't do a PhD, so I did bachelor's straight into honors. So honors is sort of like a condensed nine month version of PhD, master's type thing. And don't feel pressured to have to do a PhD because when I was at uni, I thought, oh, once I did bachelor's, I have to do a PhD, or else I'm not going to get a job. Actually, in science, a lot of people don't want you to go and do a PhD because you end up being overqualified for a lot of the entry level, level jobs. You will learn a lot more, I think, on the job for, I'm um, coming from industry, so on industrial side jobs, you will learn more on the, while working, and they would actually prefer you to do a few years working, and if you still have that passion for research, because you really need a passion for research, I think, to do a PhD, because it's so self-motivated. -motiv so. You don't, don't feel like you have to do a PhD. A lot of courses now offer honors, so it's about nine months. It's just another year on to your degree, and you will get a lot of that same experience. And if you still have that passion for research, then look into doing a PhD. But don't That's feel pressured. Okay. Um, you can kind of look at a bachelor's as taking a subject in high school. So let's say you take um, biology. That would be your bachelor's. Um, and then if you do a PhD, it's a highly, highly specialized area of biology, let's say. 
So for example, Lisa's studying um, corals. That's one aspect that's very, very specialized in biology. So you can kind of look at it as um, a, an area where you want to pretty much dedicate uh, a couple of, what, five, four, five years or so um, to something that's very, very niche, but then at the end of the day, you'll be an expert in it. Usually world expert. <laughs> yep. Any other questions in the audience? Is that a hand up there? Sorry. Yes. <laughs> you guys are much better at studying. Can we get the mic down here unless it's elsewhere? Thank you. Um, do you think that environmental studies will become more important as time goes by with like climate change and stuff? <laughs> I'm just jumping on this because I was chatting to the environmental scientist from the morning sessions. So environmental science is actually really big now. You don't think, like I remember when my dad came, so he actually was one of the first people to graduate with environmental engineering, I think from UNSW. So this is back in the 90s, it wasn't as big. But definitely now with climate change and with people looking at how much waste we're pr producing, so even in waste management, it's huge and it's out there. And you might not realize, like with my honors thesis, I could actually apply that into the environment as well. So even though I was doing molecular biology, it's not quite related, but I think most of our disciplines can get tied into environmental science now. So definitely that's a huge booming area of the, of the STEM world. Excellent, thank you. Any others? I know there are a couple of questions. Um, I'll ask one and then we'll go here. So um, there are a couple of questions here on Slido about um, lots of you guys talked about the benefits of volunteering. Um, and there are some, I'm sure a lot of the girls in the audience today just thinking, how, how do I do that? Um, and some of you said, just ask. Um, can you reflect back on yourself as a high schooler, thinking about how to get volunteering opportunities in addition to just your normal schoolwork, how you would suggest they, they go about doing that. When I was in high school, I volunteered at the animal shelter. Um, and I did that through originally a camp program where I got to know people um, and then just kind of contacted their volunteer coordinator. A lot of not-for-profit organizations have a dedicated volunteer coordinator. You can just Google it and send them an email. You don't even have to call them if you hate being on the phone like I do. Uh, <laughs> And some places will say you have to be over 18, and some places will say you have to come with a parent, but most places, as long as it's not something that could be dangerous, then they'll love to have you as a volunteer. Um, and the other thing is I did a lot of volunteering at museums. I absolutely adore museums, and I'm sure this museum has a volunteer coordinator. Uh, I'm sure your <laughs> museum has a volunteer coordinator, <laughs> and I'm sure they would love to have you. Um, so I'd say those are the, the easiest ways to get started when you're not in a university, which is an easy, which is a good place because there's always a million projects happening, is to contact museums, contact not-for-profit organizations, um, and just Google their volunteer coordinator and throw them an email. Did you have something to add, Ashley? Yeah. Um, we definitely have a volunteer program for high school students at the museum, which is great. Um, but I was also going to say is a lot of the time, a lot of colleagues that I have volunteered first before they had their jobs um, in whatever discipline they're in, regardless whether they're a scientist or in science communication or education. But as um, Rosie was saying, you just be proactive and ask those people. But quite often when you're already volunteering, that's where you get your networks as well. That's where you find other people and other opportunities that open up for other volunteering opportunities. So just take the first step and then it opens up a world of... Um, possibilities for you. Great. Scanning. Do we have? Yes. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Of course. <laughs> Short memory here, please. Um, I was just wondering how long you guys spent at uni and like whether the time that you spent there. Do you feel that that left you behind compared to people who finished high school at the same time? As well? That's a good question. So maybe as you answer, say how many years you spent at uni. So I did three and a half, purely because I wanted to go over to Spain and do a dig, which is fine. That was so worth it. Um, I actually had paid work before I finished my undergraduate degree, so it didn't feel like I was behind. I actually, um, through volunteering, I was ahead on terms of my career path, which I didn't know at the time, but it happened um, before I finished my degree. But I did take a gap year, and I felt really, really guilty about it. 
everybody else was going to uni, I felt like I stayed behind, and it wasn't, it felt like a really lame excuse at the time, I wanted to stay because I wanted to keep dancing, and I wanted to keep teaching dance, and I wasn't ready to go and move, because I moved to Sydney from Logger, so it was also a really, really big decision to move five and a half hours up to Sydney and not have anyone that I know on campus. Um, so it was actually the best thing that I ever did. I had a mental break, I prepared myself for the massive move, um, and I still didn't feel behind at all, at all in uni. So it's really individualized, it's whatever is best for you, and if you're making the most of your uni experience, don't feel like you're behind at all. Um, yeah, so um, that, I think it is a really good question, and I think um, quite a few people like at this stage, or especially at the PhD stage, are like faced with this question. <laughs> so I was like trying to like count like how many years have I spent at uni. <laughs> so quite a few. So <laughs> yeah, I mean only the vet degree is five and a half years, so you can imagine that it's coming close to ten. But um, it is also not just black and white. So when I did, for example, my master's by research in Switzerland, I was also um, like a research assistant and had a paid position. So it's not necessarily you're either a student or you are um, not a student and have a proper job. You can have both at the same time as well. Or for example, doing a PhD, um, we you have the opportunity to do teaching as well, which you get paid for. And it's also another opportunity to um, yeah, learn other skills, skills, teaching skills, social skills, psychology skills, whatever, all those inter um, social um, things. So, um, yeah, so it's, I would definitely also agree. It's one, for one thing, it is a um, very individual and it is not just black and white. And for example, one big advantage of having spent quite a long time at uni, which also goes back to the question about traveling. Um, we have heard before from Elizabeth that um, research is very interdisciplinary and um, for conferences, as, as a researcher, you travel a lot um, to go to conferences internationally and present your research. And um, this is also something that, it's just very different lifestyle to be in the uni feel because most people um, who have like work for a company, you can be lucky, like, tip, uh, like I think you mentioned that, or like you can have the opportunity to travel when you work for a company, but usually when you are a researcher in the uni field, you get to travel quite a lot. And um, like that is just something that um, just gives you a different lifestyle and more freedom in one way. So it's, you can't say one way is better than the other or one way leaves you behind more than the other. It's really what is best for you, what you prefer, what you, what you really love. So yeah, it's um, definitely, more on this gray area we have to see if you fit into. I right. quick yep. um, I think don't rush uni. Or if you don't go to uni and you get a TAFE or you take up a trade, don't rush it because you guys are still so young. You have, to, you have to immerse yourself in whatever you're doing and make the most of it um, because it's probably at the most five or six years. It's not a waste. As long as you've really learned and picked up the skills that you wanted to, to pick up, then don't worry about graduating at 23 or 25. Um, you're still super young, so don't worry about rushing through it. Excellent, so I'm gonna ask one more question and I'm gonna ask each of our panelists to answer it. Um, so this is, you have like 15 seconds, so very limited. What is one of your <laughs> highlights of your work in science to date? Right, so career to date coming from this. Um, any, any major highlights? So we'll go down the row. You're, you get the least amount of time to decide. Okay, so my biggest highlight was when I helped Violine um, go from one certification standard to the other. It was a huge project. I was taking on most of the work by myself because I was the only quality assurance person in Australia. But it's been this huge project that was taking up two years of my life and I managed to do it. And then everyone thinks I'm a rock star because of it. So. <laughs> I'd say the highlight of my career so far is the fact that um, I get paid to travel around and go scuba diving and snorkeling, and it's amazing. <laughs> awesome. Uh, not exactly a highlight, but definitely a standout, something very small though. Um, I was going through the production facility at Ansto where we were making nuclear medicine to treat cancer and diagnose diseases. Um, understanding that nuclear medicine is very sensitive to time, that production line and seeing that it had to get out at a certain time in order to save lives. That was really um, inspiring for me. 
Well, sounds very selfish, whatever I say. <laughs> 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 um, um, so I definitely had two high rides, um, spending 10 month in, months in the outback and um, studying kangaroos, finding out that you definitely eat them to help our climate. Um, was one thing, um, living out there with, um, like in a very small community, uh, learning a lot about myself, that was great, and definitely um, going out doing field work and chasing those whales to getting my samples was pretty amazing. So hard to find one highlight. Hong Kong was definitely amazing, but I think the most important thing about my job is we really love being able to offer opportunities for students, so especially low SES and students that have never before thought of a possibility in science, just being able to bring that to them in such a way that they now think that they have all the opportunities in the world. Fantastic. All right, thank you to all of our panelists. Let's give them a nice round of applause.